You're listening to the MoneyWeb SAFM Market Update Podcast with host Fifi Peters. The big debate is buzzing again. Big, of course, refers to the basic income grant, which has been proposed as a way to alleviate the huge inequalities in this country, the a huge level of poverty as well as joblessness. The hope is that the grant would encourage people to use it for, uh, you know, the uh, proper uses, such as finding a job and so become active participants in the economy. But the question is, how will it be funded in a way that doesn't break government's kitty or slow economic growth? We have got Busi Mavuso, the CEO of Business Leadership South Africa, on the market update for more. Busi, thanks so much for your time. So, so as I understand, Business Leadership uh, South Africa commissioned the study to be done or the latest study to be done by Intellidex into uh, BIG. And what is interesting is that after the findings, uh, just reading your latest newsletter this morning, you seem to have concluded that BIG should be done away with because we cannot afford it. Is is that correct? Uh, no, it's not. Good evening and thank you very much for inviting me. So we are not saying big should be done away with. I think we realize and we appreciate that there is a strong social, moral, and ethical obligation, you know, in a case that can actually be made for big, you know. So the paper does not at all question the ability of big in improving the welfare and living standards of its recipients, because I think that is a foregone conclusion. I think the only issue we are raising is that these issues cannot be the only consideration as the idea has serious implications for a country. So what we do in the paper is that we rather seek to address the affordability aspect, we address the fiscal capacity aspect, we address the issue of how we implement this without undermining the growth and employment creation agenda of the country. And I think if you look at the paper, you will see that it only says big can only be funded in three ways. We either, cut, we either cut expenditure or we issue more debt and we raise more taxes, you know. And I think we are saying that is there room actually to do any of these things, you know. And I think we go into detail in terms of looking at what does cutting expenditure mean, you know, what does issuing more debt mean, you know, what does raising taxes mean, you know, and what are the implications for all those options. And then we even go further, CC, and we say that, What are some of the options that will be sustainable and free of the unintended consequences that may be more serious than the problem being addressed? You know, so what is it that we should do as a country so that while intervening in this manner, we don't lend ourselves? in more hot water. And I think that is all we seek to do, just to say that there is more than one, two, three, or maybe four options. You know, what are those other options and what do they look like and what implications do they therefore bring, you know, for South Africa's uh, 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 fiscal and our ability to can actually fund this program. Mm -hmm. Because, ma'am, when I read your newsletter this morning, it seemed as though you seem to have come to the conclusion that, I mean, there was no winning here. I mean, you, you argue that, I mean, you cutting government expenditure or reprioritizing government expenditure from other areas, like, for instance, the national health insurance and the implications that that would have and that not presenting itself as a viable uh, solution, issuing more debt. You also argue that, I mean, our debt position is already precarious as it is, and they, therefore issuing more debt is also not a likely solution, especially with, you know, the favorable ratings uh, commentary that we've received. Uh, recently from ratings agencies. And then even the other one of raising taxes, making the argument that, I mean, even that is is, is not the the best way to do this sustainably because, I mean, you raise taxes, arguments are being made that, I mean, other people will go elsewhere. You'll have an immigration just as a result of the tax environment here being being too high. So so, so, so I'm, I'm a bit confused as to what, what, what you are saying or what revenue or, or funding avenue we have at this point in time that can go towards big? What is it? Absolutely. So, Sissy, you are absolutely correct because that is the three ways that we actually mention of cutting expenditure, issuing more debt and raising more taxes. Those are the only three ways, Sissy, in which government raises money. Not just the South African government, government all over the world. You know, if you need to get more money towards and redirect it, towards a particular intervention, those are the only three areas that you actually have available to you as government. And as you rightfully say, we look at uh, all of those three and look at what that means, you know, for South Africa. And I think we therefore come to the conclusion that all these three actually do not make sense and we don't have the fiscal room 
to can actually uh, deliver on those, you know, uh, uh, as it were, because uh, our focus is what it is, you know. But what we are arguing is that we need to focus on the interventions that will grow the economy. So if we need to look at what does growing the South African economy beyond the 2% growth rate that we have seen over the past few years mean. What, the, what are those interventions that are actually going to ensure that we start growing the economy at a higher rate than what the population is currently doing? You know, because that is what is at stake here. The reason why we find ourselves in this tight fiscal environment is precisely because we've been in a demographic recession at least for the past six years, where our population is growing at a much more higher rate, you know, than what our economy has been growing. You know, so to what extent do we therefore put in place the structural reforms that we've been talking about as business that will ensure that we attract investment, investment that will ensure that our economy starts growing, you know, at a higher rate than, 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 uh, than what it's currently doing. Because when the economy grows at a higher rate, we know that we are in a better position to actually arrest the unemployment, which is currently sitting at 46% in terms of the expanded definition, and the 65% youth unemployment, you know, as it were. You know, so it's clear to us, Sisi, that there are no shortcuts to dealing with the structural issues that we're currently facing as a country. Sisi, but when you look at it as well, you will know that you cannot lift people out of poverty through social grants. Social grants are a means to an end. They are not an end in itself. So South Africa, therefore, needs to look at what sustainable interventions are available to us. I think these young people, 65% of unemployment that we're sitting with, since they are not looking for grants. They are looking to be gainfully employed. And the solutions that we actually need to actually be putting in place as a country is precisely, you know, uh, 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 those interventions. You know, but I think we've also seen, leading up to the 2008, you know, a uh, 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 fiscal environment that we were in then, you know, we had, we were sitting in an environment where the economy grew strongly, you know, where we, 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 we enabled the dramatic expansion of social spending, including creating one of the largest social grant systems in the world. And we could do that because the economy was growing at about 6-7%. So if we want to actually put out more welfare and cover more people, you know, whether it's a big or it's whatever social welfare intervention, the solution is still growing the economy. So we can't run away from that. So we can't seek to actually put more people on a welfare system when the economy is growing at the level at which it's growing. So growing the economy, therefore, it seems to be the only intervention and solution, you know, for us to be able to get ourselves out of this economic rut that we actually find ourselves in, you know, and that is what the paper uh, 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 is argues, as it were. I hear that, and I, I, I agree with you 100% in terms of, I mean, social grants in themselves cannot be the means to an end. Growing the economy needs to be what we're looking at in terms of a long-term sustainable solution. But my question is, what happens today to those millions of South Africans who don't have a form of income, who don't have a livelihood because they don't have a job, who only rely now, thank goodness, to the extension of the 350 around COVID-19 relief grant, who, who only rely on that amongst the other grants that they get. So, 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 so what are you saying to those people? What should happen today? So I think even if we were to go and borrow money, it's not something that is actually going to happen today, you know, because we know that the process of actually trying to get more debt or raising more taxes or cutting expenditure this is not something that can happen tomorrow. So I think let's agree that whatever intervention, you know, whether we're raising taxes or we're actually issuing more debt or we are actually cutting expenditure, you know, that in and of itself is a process, the same way that growing the economy is a process. So we therefore have a choice in terms of what is it that we're actually going to be putting our time, energy and effort on. Are we going to be putting our time, energy and effort in borrowing more money? Money that is actually going to come at a much more higher cost because we are a junk status country, you know, is that the solution? Or should we be actually deploying the same effort in terms of bringing investment into the country? Because you see, it doesn't matter what kind of environment we find ourselves in, you see, the solution cannot be a populist one. The solution cannot be one that seeks to destabilize government finances. The solution cannot be one that actually sets us on a course and on a path 
you know, of collapse into the arms of our creditors. The solution cannot be one that actually is going to compromise, you know, our institutional sovereignty or rather our, our, our financial uh, sovereignty, you know, as a country. The solution cannot be one which will have disastrous social consequences. So if we agree that all these interventions are going to take time, then what is the best option in the long run for the country? Because we take time to raise debt, you know, we find ourselves in a worse of situation, we still take the same amount of time to try and bring, you know, investment into the country and implement the structural reform agenda, and that sets us on a, uh, on a path of more uh, sustainable economic uh, trajectory, as it were. So I think it's all, it, it, it's all in the options. There is no shortcut intervention uh, uh, in, 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 in as far as what we're trying to do is concerned. Mm-hmm. So, 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 I mean, uh, I imagine that you would have read the president's uh, newsletter this week. It, I, I found it very fascinating. I found it uh, to be a form of, you know, an interesting beef in uh, inverted commas between former, uh, a former state, head of state and a current head of state. Because obviously last week we heard from uh, former president of South Africa, uh, Tabombeki, talking about the fact that this government made promises for a social a compact that would grow this economy and create jobs and reduce poverty and hasn't delivered on it. So on Monday, today, our current president wrote about the social compact and how it would essentially take all agents to come on board to actually deliver on a social uh, compact that would live up to its objectives and its promises. And one of the things that the president wrote about in his uh, newsletter today was the fact that business essentially had to also come come to the party a lot more in terms of uh, carving out what the social compact, a successful social compact would be. And I'm interested in what you think that role for business is because I mean today we read about for instance the CEO of Mr. Price getting a total remuneration of around 56 million rand because his salary needed to be benchmarked to the industry uh, the the industry what's happening in the industry we also read about the former uh, CEO of Talcom having been paid 20 million rand just to as a retention uh, a bonus and this within a a society that is ranked the most the most unequal in the world, a lot of people that I've spoken to, Busi, have said that, I mean, such increases in executive pay is unreasonable in this environment. So I'm just interested in your comment on that. But I suppose more importantly, on the role that you see business playing in carving out the social compact that ultimately in this long term will grow the economy and reduce the level of poverty and joblessness. You know, Sifin, as far as the social compact discussion is concerned, we've already had six tries of this, you know, if not seven. You know, remember in 1999, we had the job summit, you know, social compact, you know, and I think uh, that did not yield the results that we actually wanted. And in 2003, we had the growth and development summit, you know, which also did not uh, lead to the outcomes that we wanted. In 2009, we had the framework agreement and netlet. And I think that was another social compact intervention that didn't need the results. In 2011, 2012, we had the social accords, you know, social compact, which also didn't deliver results. In 2018, we had the job summit, you know, social compact, which actually didn't deliver results. You know, last year we had an ESCOM social compact, which I think continues to be work in progress, but I think it can be argued that that actually didn't deliver results. And now, in 2022, we are entering into yet another social compact. So my interest you know, because I think we are having this discussion, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's late this week at NEDLEC, you know, with all the social partners. My interest would be how do we actually structure this social compact such that we learn from the uh, uh, mistakes that actually we did in the past. You know, why did those other five or six, however many I've just named, social compacts fail? You know, what is it about those interventions that actually did not get South Africa to be where it wanted to be from an outcomes perspective? You know, but I think if you just look at the current environment and if you look at what some of the issues are, you know, Sisi, Capital is like water. It will always follow the path of least resistance. You know, we've been having a conversation, for instance, recently around delivering or rather intervening in the energy security space. And we actually looked at how do we actually remove some of the constraints to ensure, you know, that uh, the private sector can meaningfully participate, you know, in the 
generation, electricity, electricity generation uh, 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 environment that we actually need to address. You know, how do we plug the six gigawatts, you know, gap? And a lot of the conversations were, you know, there is a lot of interest. There is the balance sheet that can actually uh, fund, you know, the interventions towards stabilizing our energy environment. You know, but when you look at the constraints, when you look at the environment, when you look at the regulatory rigidities, you know, when you look at the environment within which we are supposed to be investing as the private sector, that has actually not been made conducive. So if, if our solution is to try and get investment into the country so that our economy can start growing at the right levels, you just have to look at what environment will that investment be coming into? You know, what are the basics that any business will need to have in place to ensure that it can successfully operate, you know, a lucrative business in the country? And those fundamental city are the network industries. You know, no company will be able to do well in an environment where there isn't energy security. No company will do well in an environment where the ports are not functional. No company will do well in an environment where the rail system is failing. No company will be able to operate in an environment, you know, where the telecom infrastructure is not working. Yes, we know we have now auctioned the spectrum, but we know that we haven't allocated the spectrum, you know, because of those issues. So, city, those are just the basics. You know, when I say as an investor that I'm going to invest in this country, you know, the $333 billion that was committed in the investment conference in April 2022, the condition precedent and the unspoken uh, 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 quid pro quo that those uh, investors made the investment behind was that we're going to have to give us a conducive environment within which to operate. Now, if all of those that have just named the network industries are dysfunctional, how do you begin to have an investment discussion? How are you hoping that you're actually going to get the economy to grow at the right level? So you can see that from a basic perspective, you see, when I speak about structural reforms as business, this is precisely what we're talking about. No business can, and when I speak about capital being like water and it follows the path of this existence, if South Africa is going to make it difficult for investors to actually, you know, uh, uh, invest their 333 billion here, here, to be the other gateway to the African continent is Kenya. It is Nigeria, it is Rwanda, it is Ghana, it is other economies in Africa. At the moment, when you're looking at what's happening in the ports, you will see that the Darren port, Transnet port, because of its dysfunctionality is being bypassed, companies are going to the Mozambique port. And you must see what's happening at that port. You know, there is more money that is being put in to actually try and deal with the demand that is coming from South Africa. So what are we doing, therefore, to ensure that those basics are correct? So as we have the social compact discussions, if you're saying that business is going to have to come to the party and invest, you don't have to beg business to invest. That is why they sit with a huge balance sheet that they sit with, so that they can invest them, not so that the money can sit in the bank. So, but you have to make the environment conducive. So my view would be that a social compact discussion that doesn't address these fundamentals is useless. You know, because then on what basis are you, uh, are you basing this social compact discussion? In? And when you look at why the other social compact discussions have failed, you will see that it is precisely because we continue to fail to have the fundamentals right. In this country, Busi can't argue with you there, and point uh, strongly taken, ma'am. Thanks so much for your time, Busi Amavuso, the uh, CEO of Business Leadership South Africa. You've been listening to another MoneyWeb SAFM Market Update podcast, uploaded weekdays at 7 p.m. For more MoneyWeb podcasts, go to moneyweb.co.za or the app, and follow MoneyWeb News for daily updates.